Manufacturing is all around us, from raw materials, basic ingredients to the most sophisticated finished products that we all use every day. And for centuries, manufacturing has paced the growth of society. In around 1500, Gutenberg's printing press enabled the production of books, which spread information across Europe and around the world. In the late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution was started in large part by industrial production of steel. And a lesser known fact, the Wright brothers had one additional advantage, and that was their lightweight engine block, which was cast out of aluminum and gave their aircraft a little bit better chance of taking off. But let's look at this example of the past century. Of course, cars have improved enormously. But if you look at some metrics of the manufacturing process from 1920 to about 2020, we realize perhaps not so much has changed. Cars today have 10 times the number of parts as the Model T. They have about 10 times the number of assembly steps to put the car together and cost about 10 times as much as they did in today's dollars. So this is not a talk about automotive manufacturing per se, but the point here is that the basic way that we design and put products together hasn't changed in a century or more. And this is true not only for automobiles, even though we are electrifying transportation, it's also true for consumer devices. Smartphones and laptops are getting better and better, and as they get more sophisticated, the product actually gets more complex. Here, two housings, one from an iPhone 7, one from an iPhone 12, that I bought on eBay, and you just get a sense of more materials, more parts, and imagine the implication that has on the fragmentation of global supply chains. And over the past three years, we've all realized the importance of manufacturing in a new and holistic way, how manufacturing goes hand in hand with economic inequality, with the urgency of climate change, and with conflict and geopolitical tension. So the question for today is how can we reshape the complexity of manufacturing using digital technologies and digital first technologies? In around 1990, my colleagues at MIT invented a process they called three-dimensional printing or 3D printing. Now, they weren't the first to invent a process like this. There's actually several of them that were before their time in those years, but they were the first to coin the term 3D printing. You may know of ways that products are manufactured by machining, starting with a block of material and cutting the excess away, or molding using a fixed tool, how Lego bricks are made. And 3D printing doesn't require any of that. It just deposits the material that's needed right where it should go. And about 30 years or more after those seminal inventions, like MIT's first 3D printing process, only now is the technology turning the corner into production. On a day like today, there's hundreds of jet engines flying above the United States with 3D printed fuel nozzles. The commercial space industry uses metal 3D printing to make the majority of their rocket engines. And there's millions of people walking around with 3D printed hip implants. And my shoes have 3D printed soles made at scale by Adidas. But really, the technology is at its early stages, and it's only a drop in the bucket of manufacturing overall. So when I came to MIT as a professor 10 years ago, this fall, September of 2013, I had the unexpected opportunity to teach a class about 3D printing for the first time. And this was to a group of incredible students in our master's program in manufacturing. And for me, it was an opportunity to learn about this new technology and reflect it upon what's possible in manufacturing at scale. And one of those students, in the back row named Martin Feldman came to MIT from Germany, where he studied manufacturing in Aachen and worked in a foundry. And he and I got to know each other after the program was over. He came to my lab and we started having ideas about how we could potentially improve an established 3D printing process whereby metal powder is built into 3D parts layer by layer. And one thing led to another. We had a lot of meetings, we sketched our ideas, and Two years after the class started in the summer of 2015, we decided to found a company together. But we weren't ready to raise funding. We were of the type that wanted to prove our idea to ourselves before we went out and, and tried to get the support of others. So Martin decided to leave MIT, support himself full time. We shared the rent for a small space across the river from MIT. 
and Martin built a prototype, a very crude representation of her idea, moving between the machine shop at MIT and his living room, and here you see a picture of our first prototype on the wooden floor of Martin's living room with a dog just hanging outside of the frame. <laughs> but that worked well enough to prove it to ourselves and for us to go fundraising, and we went to venture capital firms and landed at one in Silicon Valley called Eclipse Ventures, which invested in our seed round and allowed us to lease a, fir a first real space in Waltham, Massachusetts in 2017. And that's where it all really started. And here you see Martin and myself standing, out of, standing outside of the first headquarters of Vulcan Forms. And over the following few months, we hired a few employees, many of whom are still with the company today, and built our first real printer about the size of a refrigerator to show that we could make some basic little parts and we could test them. And around the printer, space was limited, so we had to put the metallurgy lab next to the bathroom. And the further consideration was there was only one water source, so you could either polish the metal in the lab or you could go to the bathroom. So we had to manage things uh, carefully that way. But just as companies and organizations grow, one thing led to yet another, and four years after that, we began to fill out our first factory, and this is Vulcan One in Devons, Massachusetts. We are to have 62 of our new generation of industrial 3D printers on that factory floor, and unlike many great companies in 3D printing, we don't build the printers to sell them to others, but we build the printers to use them ourselves and produce advanced parts and products for the world's largest and most important industries. Devons is about one hour west, northwest of Boston, and about two hours uh, east, northeast of Pittsfield. This is a picture of one of our systems, the third printer that we built. We're very creative on naming, so DP3 stands for Devons Printer Number 3. <laughs> and equal to the hardware, we realized from the early days we needed to build software as well. Because the real power of 3D printing is it's a digitally enabled production process, a digital first process where the data not only determines the design, but determines the instructions for production. So when we start a production job, we begin with the CAD model, the 3D model. This is an example of a watch housing made out of titanium, which could go in a, in a regular watch, could go on a smart watch. And we begin by actually simulating the 3D printing process before anything gets loaded into the printer. The lasers scan over each layer, and there's a lot of temperature uh, and potentially thermal distortion, so we have to choose the process parameters to get that right. After we've done the simulation, we lay out the manufacturing process within the virtual volume of the printer. One part becomes many, and even many more, given the whole area that we can print on. And then during printing, we take data. We take lots of data. There's cameras and sensors in the printer that watch every time the lasers scan over the powder and every layer that is built. And using algorithms, in part driven by artificial intelligence, we can check that the process is proceeding as we expect. So we can do quality control inside the printer, and we can also get better and better in tandem with our employees' decision-making to become a more capable manufacturer over time. And when the process is complete, we have a plate of components like that. That's 600 by 600 millimeters and has about 600 watch housings uh, directly after the printing process. Now, the components aren't done at this point. It's just one printed part of a product, and we have other capabilities in-house that we're building out over time, namely machining, and typically to finish the part, you need to do machining as well as heat treatment to give it the specifications that the customer wants. So the key point of a digital-first process is that it's very flexible. It's not just about making, making watch housings, perhaps medical implants. So the next day we can change the code for the production process and make a, a plate of here, the cups used in hip implants. And what's really special, why this is 3D printed, is because it has a very fine lattice structure on the surface that enables better patient outcomes. Patients heal faster, and the interface between the implant and the bone is stronger because you can 3D print this lattice structure or you can use the same technology to make large components of jet engines. And this is just one piece, but in the future, five or 10 years from now, jet engines will be almost entirely 3D printed in far fewer components involving a much more compact supply chain. 
So what are the implications for 3D printing and digital manufacturing overall? First, a next generation of higher performance products. Second, more compact supply chains, fewer steps in the overall process of going from design to production. And third, production closer to the point of need and closer to the point of use. And many studies have concluded that the connection between production and innovation is very, very strong. In order to produce the technologies of the future, we need the production and the ideas, the innovation to be geographically close so they can go hand in hand and learn together. And this means that technology such as ours and the industries of the future will be more flexible. We can produce not only products for one industry, but products for multiple industries, next generation medical devices, aviation and space technology, clean energy technology, and the components that drive the semiconductor manufacturing revolution, which will continue for decades. And it's kind of a new look on the industries of old, this being a picture of the large former GE facility just <laughs> across the tracks, right? Uh, incredible industrialization, but a different way of vertical integration. And a couple years ago, I started thinking of the system level implications. Where do you start and where do you finish? And I believe the manufacturing of the future will be based on a digital foundation upon which you lay physical infrastructure that does the production, and then a third layer on the top that defines the products and the services. And participants in supply chains, from innovators to repair organizations, will interact with these different layers and therefore create new products that leverage this digital infrastructure. And this way of laying things out in a different way is what's called architectural innovation. I take this from Professor Rebecca Henderson uh, at Harvard Business School. You may know of the term disruptive innovation. While I was reading about disruptive innovation, I was led back to an earlier paper about architectural innovation, which is defined as the reconfiguration of an established system to link together existing components in a new way. And it turns out that this applies, in my opinion, to many of the most well-known companies of the past 20 or 30 years. TSMC, which brought semiconductor fabrication to industry through a foundry model, and Apple and Amazon and SpaceX that have incredible technology and scale, but arguably didn't do anything fundamentally new. They just reconfigured the pieces in a new way and brought a new capability to the world. And in my opinion, that's where we need to take manufacturing in the future. We have many of the pieces, if not all the pieces that we need today, but we need to reconfigure the pieces into the systems and the organizations and educate a next generation of our society to rethink how we manufacture and manufacture here in the United States and around the world. Thank you. Woo!